Hello, you all. Uh, um, my name is Andre. Oh, the pool show up again. And um, okay, my name is Andre da Silva. I'm the extension vegetable specialist. Um, and last week we talked about tomatoes, some variety selection, some crop management, some tomato desserts. But this week we are switching gears and we are talking a little bit more about the cucurbit crops and how to manage it or how to select the varieties. Actually, I'm more focused on the variety selection today because cucurbits, they are a vast different, uh, different crops like yellow squash, zucchini, uh, melons, watermelons, or even special pumps, they are all cucurbits. And I wanna focus more on variety selections for them than the management itself in your fields. So if you still have some questions after the, after the talk, like feel free to contact me or contact your a and uh, your, uh, your agent and we can like, we can come and try to solve your problems regarding preparing, um, preparing your fertilization or your planting space. We have got some questions about that. So you're more than welcome to talk with us. So you will see that today is pretty much straightforward and the crop that I'm gonna start talking about, it's zucchini cultivars. So in one of our variety trials that we conducted for zucchini, we tested 11 different varieties. The varieties are all listed in, the, in here. Uh, they come with the SV609, the SV0914, stem, payload, respect, justice tree, SV0474, the paycheck, spineless beauty, perfection, and spineless skin. <clears throat> uh, and Let's go straight for our results regarding our yield because I want to give you guys the best option available. Uh, for commercial growers, I would say, uh, okay, so first let's explain what's going on in this graph. So here we have yield in box per acre and the varieties. Varieties on green listed here are our top in that particular year. Yellows are our varieties in the middle way and the red one did not perform it as good as we were expecting. <clears throat> However, spineless beauty, spineless perfection, and spineless king is some of the varieties that for pickers. So if you have to pick your own uh, zucchini, you are more a home garden or you are in a beginner farm, that might be a good variety because although they yield a little bit lower, they're going to provide you an easier way to pick. So you're going to increase the mark the book mark the ability of your fruits because they don't have the spines that a zucchini cultivar usually has. So those are your top varieties. Those are a good varieties for beginners. But if you are in a uh, commercial uh, production scale, the 6090915 stand payload and respect were your top varieties and that's what we would uh, go with. Remember when you are pick uh, your fruits, you, you, you can separate, you should separate them in fence or medium. So fence are considered smaller, smaller fruits that are gonna go up to six inches. Everything above six inches is considered a medium. So you can get a higher price for fence. So frequently picking of your fruits would be ideal for you to increase your profit. Remember, mediums can still be sold. However, they're gonna get a lower price per box. the fence and uh, proportion of fence and median from your total fruit. Fence are represented in each bar in green while median are represented in yellow. And we conducted our picks every other day during the week for 12, for, uh, for an entire month. So we did about 12 to 15 picks. And that's, <clears throat> that's when you have start to see a reduction in your yield. But it's still, if you are a grower, you want to get the max from your, uh, from your plant. So you can do even like to 20 picks. That would be completely fine. <clears throat> so for the earth varieties, I would keep rest pack, payload, the stem in a large commercial, um, in a large, in a commercial uh, production scale. But if you are in a home garden, spineless beauty and spineless perfection would be a good option for you. Uh, moving on, when we switch for yellow squash, just remember zucchini and yellow squash, the production system is basically the same. The only thing is their change a little bit is their color and their flavor. But sometimes uh, zucchinis tend to be a tougher plant 
than yellow squash. So you're gonna see more disease, more uh, uh, less vigor on yellow squash plants when compared to zucchini. However, we still investigate some of varieties, nine different varieties now, like Gentry, Conquer Tree, Cosmo, Laser, Gold Price, and And similar to the previous slide where we have the graphs for yield, for cultivar, I did the same for yellow squash. So the cultivar gentry and conquer provide the best <clears throat> options for our uh, spring season. So if you are a growing who are planting right now in the spring, I would go with gentry and conquer. However, it's important to highlight here that gentry and conquer they are two varieties that don't have a good disease package. So if you are in an area where you have white flies that can transmit virus, or you have downy mute, or um, <clears throat> the mosaic uh, virus, those would be a problem. And you're gonna need a frequent spring. On the other hand, grand price and gold price and grand price are cultivars with a good package of disease resistance. So I would go for those two varieties if you are in a, in a region with, in an area with a lot of disease pressure. But regarding yields in our trials, what we see, saw is that Gentry and Conquer Tree were our top variety. It was followed by Cosmo, Laser, Gold Price, and Enterprise. Golden Stars and Lioness performed pretty good. Actually, for South Alabama, I would recommend Lioness. It's a very good variety. Uh, much uh, in yield, which was already expected, because usually when you have a cultivar with a good package for disease resistance, it will not yield much. And that's what we have seen on different crops, but um, I don't want that to in impact your variety selection, because sometimes, you are, like I said before, you are in an area with a high disease pressure and you might need a cultivar that yield a little bit less, but will provide you a good resistance to disease. So this can avoid you for an outbreak. Um, one of the particular disorders that, uh, or disease and uh, insects that you might have, I know that uh, Dr. A will be talking about this insect a little bit later. Uh, so I just gonna go through it very quick on yellow squash is the conifera rot. Usually when you are planting, planting uh, your squash, you might have, you might see those rotting in the, in the blossom end of your yellow squash, but also zucchini. And this is, this is a fungus that it's attacking your flower. And this is gonna happen when you have warmer and wet temperatures, uh, wet, warmer temperatures and wet conditions. So it's very common. Uh, it's hard to control. I don't know much uh, of uh, fungicides that can be used. So we have seen uh, we have seen fields being well infected by conifera. Uh, another problem caused by high temperatures are the baseball bat shape that you might see in your fruit. When you have a thinner end in your stem part of your fruit with like a regular size, or on the blossom end, this is caused by temperature. When you have high temperature, your plants are stressed and they will cause, and this will cause the disorders. This disorder here. Uh, pigeon and phytophora are common problem as well for uh, yellow squash and zucchini. Uh, it usually goes when you have high temperature and wet conditions. So it's similar to conifera and the bacteria will enter through the root system of your plants and will affect your fruit. So if you see this in the, in the field, you do have a problem with pigeon or phytophora. Squash bugs, uh, Dr. A will talk a little bit more about that, but are usually a concern early in the season. So if you, use, if you transplant or your squash or you directly seed, you must to keep uh, scouting for a squash bug because they can like destroy or outbreak your fields. Uh, but I will let Dr. A talk a little bit more about that. And finally, the oedema, it's a, it's a problem that caused by the, when you over irrigate your crops or when you have a rainfall event, you have a lot of water availability and the plant is uptake more water than it can. Consequently, it will cause the rapid growth of the cells in the fruit 
and they will break. When they break, they will cause this stain in your fruit. It doesn't say that it's a disease. It doesn't say that your fruit cannot be eaten. However, it says it's hard for a marketable. So marketable. You can use for uh, your own consume, but I would not recommend you for marketable if, because if you are in a whole sales uh, part, uh, you will not be packing those kind of fruits. So with yellow squash and zucchini disorders, uh, with yellow squash and zucchini overall, that's what I would like to show. Uh, however, and now I would like to move gears a little bit about honeydew, um, which is a crop not much, much attention in the state. However, we do can grow here. There are two, three particular main varieties that I would recommend to use here. And uh, although we, I have evaluated a bunch of other varieties in the past, I will not run away from those two, three varieties, which is the HD252, the HD150, and the OC164. They can provide a good yield, but more particularly, they can provide a higher bricks, and that's what you're looking. In one of my trials, the HD252 was consistently over two years the best variety, while the HD150 and OC However, if you have to choose between the 150 and the 164, I would stay with the 150 because they have a higher bricks than the other ones. Similar to the other ones, like total yield by the, by the varieties. Um, also, I would like to present to you guys some cantaloupe cultivars that we have available. Uh, I selected the top five that we, I have done in the past. Those varieties are Athena, Aphrodite, Infinite Gold, Da Vinci, and the F39. Um, Athena and Aphrodite I, are two very uh, common varieties. You can find seeds for them in basically any uh, seed store or like Johnny Seeds or Seedway. Those things, they sell those varieties. And by far, they perform the best. Infinite Gold is also a good variety. This is an average for one of our uh, trials that one year of trials that we did where Athena, Aphrodite, and the Infinity Gold performed the best, while the Vince and F35, F39 did not perform that good. However, I would like to emphasize one thing. If you are a uh, whole sales, you are looking for, high, oops, I'm sorry, let me come back. You are looking for a higher yield. So those three varieties would be good. If you are selling in a farmer's market or you are more, it's a very good variety and consistent high quality internally with the highest breeds over the two years that we conduct this trial. So this is a very good variety if you are, uh, uh, if you're doing like a home garden or if you are a beginner farm, the Vince is very good. I need to, I just need to say that the Vince don't have a very good disease package. So you might face some of disease problem here and there. But these are like, this is an, a variety for the beginners while commercial growers would stay with Athena, Aphrodite and Infinite Gold. Uh, so switch gears uh, once again for watermelon. Watermelon, we have a lot of home, home gardens. Uh, but also beginner farmers want to play with watermelon. Commercial growers love it. And watermelon is a particular crop that we are giving a lot of emphasis. So we're evaluating every year about 30 varieties. Um, this year, uh, we're going to have one of our variety trials with David in, um, in Clanton. So if you guys would like to stop by and see what we are testing there, you're more than welcome. So one particular uh, thing that I need to say is in our watermelon variety trials, we do seedless uh, watermelon and they need pollinizer. SP7 from uh, variety, uh pollinizers that we have nowadays. And I strongly recommend with you guys to use that. Uh, Sakata also has a variety, a pollinizer variety called uh, wild card. It's very common to see, however, wild card has a very quick development after planting. So you want to delay your, the planting of your, um, your pollinizer if you are using wild card a week when compared to your regular variety, your female variety. 
because you wanted them to be in the same size when you're transplant plants to the field. Uh, watermelon, I like to separate them and show you guys by, uh, by size of fruits. We have 60 counts, 45 counts, 36 counts and 30 counts. How, we, how This is how wholesales will sell it where 30 counts are your biggest melons, 21 or pounds or more. 36 pounds go from 17 pounds to 21 pounds, 45, 13 pounds to 17, and six counts are the smallest melons from nine to 30 pounds. So like I always show in my uh, variety trial for selection, I pull out a graph with the total yield by variety. And in our, our variety trial, we got all these varieties in greens with similar yield. I would say that Talca, Blackjack, Red Umbar, all the new Syngenta varieties with WDL 64, 24, 64, 29, and 64, 21, the 7187, Joy Reed, Cracker, Cracker Jack, Guardsman, and Charismatic, and the 7197 were our top variety for um, wholesale market. For beginners farm and for uh, for uh, home gardens, I would strongly recommend Blackjack. Blackjack is a new variety. It was released two years ago. And for those growers who used to go Sangria, which is an old variety, Blackjack is just an evolution of Sangria. It's just a better variety. So if you are used to Sangria, which you, Every year we have seen a lack of seeds available. Blackjack is an option. So, and it has a very high uh, uh, bricks content. Like I said before, some of the varieties that have been um, top in my variety trials over five years that we have conducted this trial would be like Talca, Blackjack, Red Umber, Joe Reed, Charismat, Fascination and Captivation. They have been always having top yields regardless of year. So I strongly recommend if group here, they are very good one. While Turn Park and Troubledore, they are they are Harris uh, Moron varieties and they produce very large fruits. So if you are looking for a variety with large fruits, I would stay with Troubledore or Turn Park. Just for you to have an idea, uh, I separate uh, the total yield by size, 60 counts, 45 counts, 36 counts, and 30 counts. So as I, you see, uh, Blackjack produced like bigger fruits, uh, was a, the variety that produced the biggest fruits. Uh, Talca produced the largest 36, Red Umber, the largest 45 counts, and Talca, the largest 60 counts. It's still, if you are a grower for holy sales, you don't want big fruits, neither, like you don't want a 60 counts, neither 30 counts. You want to stay on the 45 and 35 counts. So varieties that achieve it, 7% of their yield as 45 and 35 counts were the 7197, Charismatic, the 7408, Embassy, the 7401, Turnpike, 8415, Red Opal, 7406, Joy Reed, 6421 and secretariat. So if you are a commercial in a large scale commercial production, which we have 75% or more or 45 or 35 count. If you are a smaller grower target larger fruits, I would go with blackjack or trouble door. So that's something that you must keep in mind. <clears throat> But most important, other than size of the watermelon, is the bricks content. If you are selling your watermelon, or even if you are eating your watermelon, you want to get the sweetest melon as possible. And bricks is what it represents. It's the, the soluble solids of your fruit, which is the, the, the sugar concentration in the fruit. And commercially, you don't want to have uh, you cannot, like, in a commercial scale, you will not be able to sell your fruit if the bricks is smaller than 12%. So you want a variety that can yield more than 12%. Above 10% is, a very, is already a very uh, 
sweet fruit, but you don't, you want to go higher than 12%. That's the ideal fruit. And in this black and this red line here represent our 12% bar and the fruit and the varieties circled by red are the one who achieved that 12%. So like I said, black jack, the 6375, 6429, Joe Reed, Cracker Jack, 7196, <coughs> Lucille, Embassy, Fascination, the 7401 and the 7408 were varieties who achieved that tricks that we are looking for. So keep that in mind. You are not looking only for the highest yield. You are not looking only for the better number of fruit, but you are also looking in watermelon, the bricks of your fruit. Um, I put here also some uh, problems that you can have, although I call disorder, I also like to include some insects or disease. And uh, one of a common problem that uh, you guys can find in our area here in Alabama, uh, is fruit blotch, which is the sun exposure. When your fruit is exposed to the sun, it can have it can have this stain in the fruit, and that's going to turn them unmarketable. So make sure that you have a good coverage of your uh, canopy. So this way, the fruit exposure is minimal. Another common disorder is hollow heart. Hollow heart is the crack inside your fruit. As you can see here, I put different levels of hollow heart. Hollow heart is usually caused by a bad pollination. When you have the flowers open and high heat stress or dry stress that is common in Alabama, pollination is poor. Consequently, you're gonna have that impact that it's causing hollow heart. But hollow heart is a combination of a bad pollination with lack of the season and you think that if you cut your irrigation to make your fruit sweeter you are actually not doing good for your fruit the fruit will not get sweeter because you are cutting water it will get sweeter because it's uptaking more nutrients and when it's uptaking more nutrients you need to have available uh, water available and if you don't have water available you will not have that sweeter plus you're going to induce the cracker because the cells of your fruit internally will think that they can grow but they don't have water and they need their nutrients to grow. They will wrap it and cause the black, the, the hollow heart of your melon. So keep that in mind. Selecting a good planting date when your flowering is not under higher temperatures and provide good water availability to the plants in the end of the season during fruit maturity, it's going to uh, minimize uh, hollow heart of your fruits. Two diseases that are very common and causing problem for us is gummy stem blight that you can see is like, look like a gam or an eye brownish in the middle of your leaf and it extended to the, to the edge of the leaves. This is gam, gam is ten blight and that's a problem. So let's check it every year and try to rotate some crops. And fusarium wilt, fusariums are very common. It's looked like your uh, disease and your looks like your plant is wilting and dying. And you might think that is lack of water, but actually it's not. Actually, this is, oops, actually this you don't have any variety resistant to fusarium right now. And if you have in your field, that's a big problem and hard to control because we have seen fields over 10 years with like, without watermelon and fusarium is still being uh, a problem in that field. So keep that in mind. If you have a fusarium, a crop rotation to minimize the damage is very important. I will switch gears from uh, watermelon uh, to special pumpkins. I know that it's a lot of information, but I would like to give as much as possible variety so you can have a successful crop this year. So in one of our trials last year, we evaluated uh, Kabocha special pumpkins, but also other special, special pumpkins that I will talk later. And those are some pictures of the varieties we tested last year. Umber Max, Chata, Geisha, Delica, Golden Buddha Bowl, the Shokchi, Green, Sunshine, Speckle Pop, Winter Sweet, and Sweet Mum. And what I want to go here is over the total yield, number of fruit, and fruit weight for those ones. Because sometimes a grower are looking for highest yield, others they are looking for higher number of fruit, others they are looking for fruit weight. And this is because sometimes uh, we have a lot of pumpkin patches in the state. And that's a good information for pumping in patches. So total yield among our variety was the highest for 
field. But it was not different from geisha, delica, and the speckle pup and sweet mama. So if you are looking for higher yields in pounds per acre, those are the varieties that I would be uh, suggesting you guys to plant. Golden Buddha bow, sweet mama, all the way to sweet mama. However, if you are a grower looking for more number of fruits, which is our second graphic here, you can see that shock chijan green was our best option and achieved the highest, the highest number of fruit. They are smaller fruits though. So if you are looking for fruit weight, they will not be an option for you. When you're looking for fruit weight, the variety geisha was our, our topest variety on the average weight of the fruit. So that's where you want to uh, stay between golden boat and bow, geisha for total yield, shing shing, uh, shock she green for the number of fruits and the variety geisha for the highest number of, uh, uh, the uh, highest average uh, fruit weight. So those are information for those um, pump, pumpkin patch growers that would like to attract more uh, visitor for their farm. And in the similar pattern, I put some other special pumpkins like the flat white boar, the Mariana di Choga, speckle hound, porcelain doll, and Mike Price. We did this trial, uh, this particular trial, we did in the south. Also produce special pumpkins because our mindset is that most of our special pumps are produced in the north portion of the state where they had cooler temperatures. But if you decide the optimum planting date for your special pumps, you can also do that in the southern portion of the state. So just for you guys to have an idea, our yields were as high as, for, as in the north that I just showed before. And our total yields reached almost 25,000 pounds per acre, which mine price was and porcelain doll was our best varieties for total yield. Similar to the to the kabocha trial, if you are planting, if you are looking for a largest number of fruit, the speckled hound was our variety who produced the largest number of fruit, while the Marianne, Mariana di Chioggia was our variety that produced the lowest number of fruit. First, uh, total yield was a little bit reflected from the average fruit weight. So porcelain doll and mine price was our variety for uh, the average number of weight. But I would like to emphasize here, if you have a uh, variety, want to diversify. So this way you can attract all the clients. This way, if you have a problem with a disease, one of particular variety might be resistant to that disease and the other not. So while others not. So keep that in mind that that can be an option for you guys. <clears throat> um, and the, one of the things that I always keep emphasizing during my coach for talks is about the, uh, the impact of temperature, of weather conditions, moisture and temperature on your plants. So this way I like to show you, I, I put here a table showing when are the best planting dates during the spring and fall season for north portion of the state and the south portion of the state for all the varieties that are all the crops that we talk about today. So let's say that in the no you are in North Alabama in the spring and you want to plant yellow squash and zucchini, you want to put them in the field all the way from April to early September. Late in early September, your pollination, it will be too cold and we will be not be able to plant. If you are planting in the North Alabama during the fall, you don't want to plant much uh, more than August. So I would say if you're going to go all the way to August 30, you are good but you don't want to plant later than that. If you are in the south portion of the state, you can plant March or in April and in, in, uh, during the, the spring and July and September during the fall. This is for yellow squash. Melons, they can be planted in April and May, but I would, although we do can plant melons in August, I would avoid it because there is a high risk of disease in the early season and you can lose South Alabama, March and May for the for melons and same thing for the fall, I would, I would avoid it. Watermelons, just one season. I would not recommend watermelons during the fall and you need to know your, tar, your market for watermelons. Usually if you are producing in a larger scale or you wanna sell in the farmer markets, people looking for 
uh, watermelons during the 4th of July or the Memorial Day. So planting between April and May in North uh, Alabama and March and April in the South Alabama, it's ideal. Keep in mind different varieties have different, uh, have different uh, harvesting dates. Usually for watermelon, you're looking for something between 80 to 100 days. So just play with your planting day there. Special pumpkins in the spring, we don't recommend it much, but we do recommend planting the fall. North Alabama, July and August, and South Alabama, August and September. This way you can target the Halloween. So if you are planting even your regular pumpkins, those are the dates that you are looking for to plant. Um, I don't want to go more in depth with planting dates because it's specific for each location. I just would like you guys to keep in mind that looking for a certain um, certain time of planting where your temperature and your weather conditions will not affect your crop and selecting the opt variety for your location or for your management conditions is the first step for you to ensure that you're going to achieve uh, you're going to be successful and achieve the potential yield your area can do. So with that, I would like to thank you guys. I don't want to get that longer, but if you guys have any questions, please, I'm here to answer.